people don't understand independence. The pollsters are all over the place. The journalists are all over the place. What do you think is the is the biggest kind of misconception about independence? Most people choose to be independents because they just don't like the parties, and right. they don't they don't want to be categorized in those ways, and they want um, they want to vote for the person, not the party. The lack of research on you know the the voting patterns uh, and who the independent voter is voter is, is, is really astonishing. If I was a you know, partisan and part of the party, I would really want to have a deeper insight into the voting patterns of independence. And I would be very alarmed, you know, that 52% what of millennials and 52% of Gen Z now are not party affiliated. This is yeah. a society, you know, that valorizes identity, that valorizes people's right to uh, identify themselves and to describe themselves and to align themselves in whatever way they might choose. But when it comes to this very fundamental issue of how you as an American want to classify yourself, the idea that you choose to be an independent is immediately invalidated by the dominant scientific approach to understanding this phenomenon. And as people continue to leave the two-party system, understanding this complex voter is important. Thank you everyone for taking some of your day today to join us for what I, I uh, anticipate is gonna be a really rich and interesting conversation. My name is John Opdyke. I'm the president of Open Primaries and I'm joined today by Tom Riley and Jackie Salet, the co-founders and co-directors of the Center for an Independent and Sustainable Democracy at Arizona State University, and also the co-authors with Dr. Omar Ali of a great new book, which everyone should go out and buy five copies of today. It's that good. It's called The Independent Voter. Uh, welcome, Jackie and Tom. You've both been very busy. Thanks yeah. for having us, John. Yeah, thank yeah. you, John. Great to be here. Yeah. Uh, I have a, a number of questions, but before we dive into that, I, I had the privilege of attending your official launch of the new center in Washington, D.C. a couple weeks ago and wanted to show a video, a short video that was recorded by the president of Arizona State, Michael Crow. Uh, talking about the launch of your new center. So I wanted to show that video and then uh, I have a number of different questions for you, both about the center and also about your book. So Russ, go ahead and cue the video. Hi, Michael Crow here, president of Arizona State University. Sorry, I can't be there with you for the launch of the Center for Independent and Sustainable Democracy. This really is a, a, a critical evolutionary uh, a moment in terms of the further evolution of American democracy in, in the sense that, as we have experienced in the past, all things are in a state of flux. There are Democrats, there are Republicans, there's independents, there's more independents than there's ever been before. There's lots of discussion on both sides of the equation, all three sides of the equation about election reform. There's uh, hunger out there for uh, uh, finding ways to get uh, the best candidates from the Republican side or the Democratic side or an independent side. There's a desire for new ways of thinking about things. And so, so this new center is focused on that. And this is one of our roles at the university. One of our roles at the university is to do all that we can to help the design of the democracy to be successful. Parties and the manifestation of parties have been changing from the founding of the Republic until now, and they will continue to change. And so in all of that, how do you find ways in which those individuals who are not aligned with a party have voice, vote, voice within a democracy where party is the dominant methodology for candidate selection, party is the dominant methodology for identification of, of uh, trajectories. And so it's not our position as a university to favor one trajectory versus another trajectory. It's our position as a university to understand things to understand how they might work, to understand how they help the democracy to be successful. So this center with ASU support is basically focused on how do we gain and expand our political understanding of the American electorate in the first quarter to the first half of the 21st century as it is evolving and what we want to see happen with the voice of that electorate as it moves forward. And so 
Very exciting project that you're working on. Look forward to seeing some of the results of the kickoff. And uh, again, sorry that I can't be there. Thanks, Russ. That's such a great endorsement from the president of what I believe is the largest public university in America. I think listening to him talk about that mission, it's so exciting to gain an understanding of the American electorate as we enter you know, this first quarter of the 21st century. How, how did you get there? How did you come up with the idea to launch this center with such a great name, Independent and Sustainable Democracy? Share with us briefly the origin story uh, for this new center at ASU. Jack, you wanna start and then I'll jump in. Sure, of course. Um, we started, uh, when Tom was uh, directing the work at the Morrison Institute at Arizona State University going back I don't know, maybe six or seven years ago, uh, we started to work on developing some projects together uh, to have a look at the independent voter. The number of independents in, in the state of Arizona was uh, rising very significantly. There was a lot of talk and, and, and uh, some projects at the time to try to look at ways to restructure the Arizona election system to admit independence more fully into the process. And in the course of that, we began talking with uh, various uh, folks at ASU, including President uh, Crow, who I have to say, even back then, uh, was very, very enthusiastic about it. And, and part of what he said to us, John, was, you know, this is gonna be a critical issue for the nation. And it's a critical issue for the state of Arizona. We're, we're based here. And uh, we've got to plant a flag in this arena. We've got to lead in this issue. And so that basically led to a series of events. The Morrison Institute uh, hosted uh, its uh, State of the State event on the theme of the independent voter, which uh, Tom and I both spoke at. We brought in people from all around the country to talk about it. Uh, and we started to find, wow, you know, there was really a lot of interest in pursuing it. And, so uh, Tom and I worked on various things. We did a joint project uh, with the Schwarzenegger Institute over at USC. Uh, we wrote a chapter in a book called Democracy Unchained. And then we basically decided, hey, let's, let's see whether this is a moment where we can institutionalize this work, set it up under the umbrella of ASU, get a blessing from the president, and start to really focus on an area that just needs so much attention and so many it needs such a, it needs a new reframing it needs a reset and we really felt that asu would be the place to do it and we got tremendous feedback and support both from president crow and from dean cynthia leitz who gave the uh, the welcome address at the dc event and here we are Right. Yeah, John, if I can add to that, too, is yeah. that, you know, and then as we begin looking at the focus of the uh, center, it kind of uh, moved us in, in two directions. One is to really look at a deep dive about who the independent voter is. Um, you know, hopefully we'll get in a little bit today, too, but the, the, the lack of research on, you know, the, the voting patterns uh, and who the independent voter, in, voter is, is is really astonishing. So one is to try to look at that, you know, as this number rises and as people continue to leave the two-party system, that um, understanding this complex voter is important. Um, the second focal area really centered on the issue of non-governance uh, structures, nonpartisan, excuse me, nonpartisan right. governance structures. Um, and um, that was kind of the, the two thematic issues of our book, too. One is who the independent voter is, but a lot of the discussions and where we go from here really led us to how do we kind of expand the nonpartisan ballot? How do we look at different governing structures? You know, that I, I talk about timing. Um, just this morning, I got in my in, in my inbox two articles about independent voters. One of them said, this is this morning said that independents have swung to the GOP in the last two weeks in the, in the midterms by 20 points. The other one said, and I have to read this quote to you because it's so outrageous. This is an article that's been syndicated in over two dozen newspapers. It says, declaring oneself an independent is increasingly no more than a form of virtue signaling. 
States without open primaries render independence politically irrelevant, yet both parties moderate previous positions to attract their votes. Independents are just as partisan as other voters. They only differ in the combination of issues about which they are partisan. So going to something you both said about people don't understand independence. The pollsters are all over the place. The journalists are all over the place. What do you think is the is the biggest kind of misconception about independence, and what are you looking to 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 engage and challenge? Well, oh, Jack, maybe I'll just start, and you can jump in too. Is that, you know, I think one of it it's 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 been framed by the by academia, right, in the political science field, and this goes dates back to how we start uh, understanding people's political persuasion and, and choices, right? And so we we ask them questions. So back to the 1960s, we've been asking individuals how they identify themselves. If they identify themselves as Republicans, we accept it. If they identify themselves as Democrats, we accept it. If they identify themselves as independents, um, we don't really believe them, so we ask a follow-up question, right? And the follow-up question is, do you lean towards Republican or Democrat? Um, and it's because that framing of who the independent is and, and, and that follow-up question, and then most of the research in, in political scientists has followed, you know, if you say you lean Democrat, then how do you vote in that election? Right. And not to a surprise, you know, how they're leaning in that question is probably how they're going to vote in the next election. So, so what's happened is that um, through collecting this data, most, you know, the pr predominant you know, position of uh, uh, political science has been is that most people profess to be independent, but they're really leaners, and that uh, the number of true independents is less than 10%. Um, and then even if you start looking at how this data has been collected, um, instead of even looking at a larger point scale about how people fall within a continuum or whether they're leaning or not, um, most of them even collapse the field and basically say, if you're a leaner, we're going to count you as a Republican. If you're a leaner right. Democrat, we'll count you as a Democrat. So the biggest misconception is one is, you know, that they aren't, people aren't really independent. Um, and the, the problem with that is that there has been so little study of looking at voting patterns over time or down ballot, right? Uh, you know, one of the most recent articles that we have coming out that was just accepted last week into uh, uh, one of the academic journals really looked at voting patterns over time okay from, um, uh, 1970 to 2022 and what we found is that independents are all over the place right is that there, there's there's not partisan loyalty uh, they're very unpredictable and they they move in and out of independent status over time so I think this is the real key going forward. And as we see larger numbers of people identify as independents, then what is their voting pattern? What motivates them to vote? And why are they moving in and out of, of independent status? Yeah, a um, couple of things I would add. First of all, <laughs> I have to laugh at the, uh, the notion that uh, deciding to be an independent is a form of virtue signaling. Right. Right. Um, so, uh, gosh, I, I almost feel like we have to pause and unpack that a little bit <laughs> since most people choose to be independents because they just don't like the parties and right. they don't they don't want to be categorized in those ways. And they want um, they want to vote for the person, not the party. And we've done you know many, many surveys about this uh, under the auspices of independent voting, just literally talking to independents and asking them to explain why they made that choice as opposed to, you know, all of the interpretations that are being uh, offered to us by media and pundits and some aspects of political science and so forth. But, you know, in, in, a, in, an, in an environment where uh, the, the partisan culture is so extreme and so many Americans are so upset about it, the idea that one might decide to identify oneself as an independent as a way of separating oneself from that. I don't know why you would call that virtual virtue signaling. Right. First, of all, first of all, most Americans, <laughs> independents and others don't even know what that term means. But uh, I barely know what that means. But uh, aside from that, I, I think that you see, when uh, Tom's point about the follow-up question that has dominated the, you know, the political science paradigm is so important, and 
I, I think it's really important not to skip over it. This is yeah. a society, you know, that valorizes identity, that valorizes people's right to uh, identify themselves and to describe themselves and to align themselves in whatever way they might choose. And that's very broadly accepted within the society. But when it comes to this very fundamental issue of how you as an American want to classify yourself in the, in the context of our, of our political system, the idea that you choose to be an independent is immediately invalidated by the dominant scientific approach to understanding this phenomena. So there's something, there's something very wrong there. It's both wrong, I think, just from an analytical and a scientific point of view, but just also from a humanistic point of view. Yeah. These Americans are saying something about themselves and what they believe and how they want our political culture to be. And so then, you know, the pundits, the pollsters, the media and everybody is like just rushing to deny that. And that that's very, very seriously wrong. Yeah, now, I think you know, the issue of being so dismissive of this large group of voters, um, you know, if, if I was a you know partisan and part of the party, I would really want to have a deeper insight into the voting patterns of independence. And I would be very alarmed, you know, that 52% what of millennials and 52% of Gen Z now are not party affiliated. Um, you know, that has just, just, you know, tremendous implications going forward. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I, I think, you know, even if you look at our center, which, which you know, I think our center by having Jackie and I serve as co-directors, you know, we, we want to be academically informed, but we want to be plain spoken, right? You know, I mean, it was, we were very, uh, 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 deliberate in ensuring that we had this kind of mix that uh, Jackie coming from the grassroots perspective, I, I've been an, a practitioner for a long period of time too. But the fact that, you know, there really isn't any other research institution that we know of in the United States with any university that really focuses on who the independent voter is, um, which is in and of itself, I think pretty interesting. Yeah, there's a great section in the book uh, that really hit me hard where you you quote Morris Fiorina from Stanford, where he says, this is simply not done in sociology and in polling, where you ask someone, how do you think about yourself? And then when they say X, you say, well, forget about that. How do you really think about yourself? Like it's so, it's so violative and unscientific. I'm not a conspiracy theorist, but tell me, how, how does that happen? Is it pure just, hey, the two parties want to keep everybody in a box, and so they muscle the pollsters? But like, how does that kind of dishonesty, how does that become so dominant and so mainstream? Well, you know, one, I mean, there's a lot of different ways to look at it. Uh, one, one way to look at it, John, is um, I, it makes me think of the book, uh, the wonderful book called Indispensable Enemies that uh, Walter Karp, the late Walter Karp uh -huh. wrote. And um, he did, you know, this incredible uh, sort of deconstruction of how the parties operate and how they wield power. And one of the things that he says that he, that he writes about in the book is how control of nominations and control of categories is central to party power, and that's how they operate. And so I don't, it's, in, in some respects, I would say that you could, you could come up with a conspiracy theory and it would be accurate. Uh -huh. <laughs> it's, almost, it's so bad that yeah. you, you don't even have to have that. It's just how these institutions operate, control of nominations and control of identification. That's the whole game from their vantage point. And so unfortunately, I think political science, let's you know, give them the benefit of the doubt here, fell prey to the muscle power of the parties and right. the extent to which they dominate the political scene. And I have to say that going back to, you know, it was so wonderful to watch the video of Dr. Crow's remarks, you know, that he gave us for, you know, for our launch event in DC, because he says, it's very, very pointed. He says, well, how do you find ways to create a voice for those who don't want to identify with a political party in a system that is completely determined 
by the political parties. And, you know, and, and he's saying, hey, you know, let's, we want this center, we want ASU to be out in front on this question, because this is such an important question. But the way that he defines the challenge uh, is very, very poignant to me. And, right. uh, it, and, and so I just, I really appreciate, I appreciate the intelligence of the statement. And I also appreciate the trust that he's placing in us to really try to break through some of these barriers. You know, part of what we wanna do, and I think Tom is just brilliant at this, is we wanna challenge political science in terms of their methodology, but we also wanna to try to give them some new tools. <laughs> like we think they, right. really, they took a very wrong turn a number of decades ago, and we wanna to try to put them on a better path in the context of a political and cultural crisis that is so enormous, you know, that it, it's it's hard to fathom what it is that's happening in this country. Well, let and me I, ask I you. Think, uh, I was going to say, I think yeah. it, deserves, uh, uh, um, it, it deserves a deeper investigation. And I think that's okay. what I share with a lot of my academic colleagues is that, yeah, you know, there are independents that are leaners. Uh, a, a large portion of independents, independents don't vote. There's legal reasons and there's barriers. There are all these things, but just to be so dismissive as the number of individuals grow who are non-party affiliated, um, I think, you know, deserves a further investigation. Um, as I said, you know, this study that we did in looking at voting patterns over time, you know, I, I'm just pretty amazed that that type of research hasn't been done before. You know, it's, it's, it's interesting. Yeah. Staying with this, this kind of theme of the, the control of the categories. One of the things that um, really jumped out at me in your book was you talk about how the dominant kind of way of understanding America right now is that we're divided, that Americans are kind of irreconcilably divided against one another. And that's a, a narrative that um, is very deep and very broad. But you pose a different way of looking at things, which is not that the American people are divided, that the American people are in motion. And I was that really, that there's something that really um, hit me about that. Um, is that an element of what you're looking to unpackage at the center and explore deeper, not just independent voters qua independence, but some of these other broader political understandings like division versus motion. Is that important? Oh, I think that's really important. And uh, a, a couple of things that I would say about that, uh, you know, for the last several weeks, because we're like in pre-election mode, right? You know, um, and that it, there's like a certain thing that goes on. And, and one of the things that goes on is that the media, and I see some of some of the people who are making comments in the chat here are talking about the role of the media, and that's really important. But one of the things that happens at a moment like this is that uh, you start getting people who are quote unquote experts in different fields start getting uh, contacted, you know, by um, television producers and reporters and so forth. And Tom and I have been getting our share of outreach um, and uh, and talking to uh, you know to people who were writing on this and reporting on this and so on and so forth and invariably invariably the calls and the conversations start out with I hear you're an expert on independent voters how are independents going to vote in this election uh -huh. <laughs> you know and um, so you know we we might have some things to say about that. Uh, based on polling that we've looked at or conversations that we've had or settings that we've been in and so on and so forth. We're not especially privy to some sort of secret chamber of, you know, of, of, de of decision trees, you know, by 50% of the country who call themselves right. independents. But one of the things that's so interesting, so, you know, you, you kind of respond and you give them a feel for that. And we, you know, we're knowledgeable about this and we have things to say about Arizona and things to say about Pennsylvania and Ohio and Georgia, et cetera, et cetera, you know, and all of this. Um, but the thing that to me is so interesting, and I think it goes at the question that you're talking about, is that we also try to 
to discuss with these media representatives that the phenomena that's underway here is not just about what independents are going to do in this election cycle or even what they've done in previous election cycles, which simply validate the extent to which they are in motion. But there's something, the, the, the system is going through a, a, a breakdown of sorts and, uh, and people are in motion and the trust in the institutional framework is at an all time low. There is an experience that so many people have that the system isn't working and you know you don't have to be uh you know an academic researcher or a political activist like my you know i went to the dentist yesterday and i was talking to my hygienist and you know we, she asked me what i did and i told her what i did and she said oh yeah independence you know it's because you know you just want to be able to think for yourself and you want right. to be able to choose the person who you think is the best person for the job you know whatever it is that's going on so you know the dental hygienist you know, has a better understanding <laughs> of what it is that, you know, is happening, in, you know, in the lives of the American people, then, you know, the, the people who are on TV, who are, you know, narrating the story, yeah. of what it is that's going on. So I think for us, um, you know, part of what we wanted to do with the book and part of why we wanted to write the book, and we were, you know, just very fortunate to find a publisher who, was very excited about the project, you know, who who pushed us to finish the book quickly so we could get out into the marketplace now, you know, which is where we are. But there's, yes, the question of how independents are going to vote in this cycle, it's important. Independent voters are likely going to determine the outcome in some yep. of these very close election states. There's no question about that. And there's going to be a deeper story to look at. But that's not the only thing to look at. There, there really is a profound um disalignment that's going on and 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 so that raises for us uh the question and we hope our center can contribute to this we think it will what kinds of new structures need to be put in place what kinds of new coalitions need to be built what kinds of new ways of looking at these issues need to be introduced in the academy in media, um, you know, and and that's what we're trying to do because this thing is really becoming very unglued, and that's very very serious. But it's also positive in the sense that it creates an environment for new things to come into being, and and I think that's in some ways you say, well, what do independents stand for? Well, independents stand for a lot of different things, like all Americans do, but they also have a very a very elevated sense that the, the system has to be reimagined and recreated. And we're right. hoping that we can help with that process. Now, John, what's, um, you know, one of the areas where there, there is increasing a lot of discussion, um, and this is some of the work we've done with open primaries, is, is you know, how partisan our election system is. You know, I, I recently just pinned a, 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 a column on Secretary of State's and, you know, that has generated a lot of discussion. We start oh, talking right. That's great to hear. about Secretary of State. I mean, it's just like, yeah, we actually elect our Secretary of State in this country. Uh, so they run in these really hyper-polarized elections. Um, and then whoever wins is expected to be this neutral arbiter of uh, election information and fairness. Uh, and now that we have individuals running as election deniers, looking to populate election center with poll workers to disrupt the system, you know, people are saying there, there has to be a different way, you know, whether other democracies handle this differently. Um, but everything has become so, so hyper um, partisan. Um, I think people are kind of desperate of looking at alternatives. Uh, and, and that's one of the things we're looking at is nonpartisan alternatives. That's great. Um, and, you know, in the past, most people never talked about what a secretary of state did. You know, they just actually, then they run elections and count votes and, 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 and declare the winner and then we move on. No, right. we don't do that anymore. Um, this this uh, partisan system that we have is being exploited, right? Uh, for yeah. a whole host of reasons. All right, we have a number of questions. Uh, just to remind everybody today, if you wanna ask a question, just type your name, your state, and a one sentence summary of what you wanna ask. Put that right in the chat. 
and we're going to get to as many questions as possible. Uh, first, we're going to start with Bob Pearls in New Mexico, uh, a question about uh, what kind of electoral changes that we need to see. Go ahead, Bob. Oh, thanks. I, I didn't know you were going to call on me. It's great to see everybody. We've been at this for seven years in New Mexico. I'm a registered independent founder of New Mexico Open Elections. And, you know, we can debate back and forth about, about why candidates are polarized, why voters are polarized. And in the end, it's really a systems analysis or a root cause analysis of why nobody talks to one another. So what we've been trying to figure out, as well as most of the people here, is what kind of election system would allow candidates to build coalitions, would allow more voters to engage. Um, are nonpartisan primaries the answer? Is the Alaska model the answer? Um, is simply allowing independents to vote in partisan primaries? Is that really going to change the dynamics? And it seems not to, to a large degree, even though as an independent, I want to be able to vote in a primary in New Mexico. We still have closed primaries. So I'd love to hear what the panelists think about if you were to prioritize what three or four pieces of legislation you could pass tomorrow, what would they be? You know, that's a, a, a great question. Um, but, you know, I think that if we look at our current election system in the United States, it, it, it varies from state to state and even within states. You know, where the vote counting occurs is the 10,000 jurisdictions we have across the United States at yeah. the very local level. So I think one thing is that we shouldn't really be pushing for a one size fit all um, way of doing things. Um, we have a lot of variety uh, that's good and bad, but I think it allows for a lot of uh, experimentation, as you had mentioned, is that, you know, states have looked at ranked choice voting, they looked at top four, top five, top two, uh, open primaries, there's a whole host of areas. But, you know, I think bottom line is that when you, when you tell people, you know, you shouldn't have to join a party to vote, I think it resonates with a lot of individuals. Uh, and then when they start thinking about how elections are done, that the majority of at least our congressional uh, and, and some of the other down ballot are determined in the primary, which in many cases are gerrymandered, uh, but are dominated by one party or another, you know, many people kind of see th this unfairness of that process. So, you know, in, in our book, we talk about kind of a host of areas, again, not a one size fits all. But I think the good thing is that many states are experimenting um, with these different models. Uh, we talk in the book also about, um, you know, expanding the nonpartisan ballot, you know, that the nonpartisan ballot came as progressive era to kind of combat a lot of the corruption that was occurring. And it has served us fairly well in many instances at the local government level and school boards and judicial races. And there's no reason why that perhaps can't be pushed up. Um, we also talk about the issue of the Secretary of State. Uh, you know, overwhelmingly, people think it is fundamentally ridiculous that we elect partisan individuals to that party, I mean, to the, that position or yeah. appoint them, you know, 25 states elect them, another 10 states appointed by governor or the legislature. Um, but not even a commitment uh, to run that office in a nonpartisan in neutral manner. And, you know, the, the system all worked so, so well when we had a check and balance system between the Democrats and Republicans, right? When we had true competition in the 50 states, uh, when people acted in good faith. And we're seeing a breakdown of all three of those levels, right? There, less than 25 of the states, there's any type of competition because it's dominated by one party. You know, 42 to 46 percent of the electorate are not now part of Democrat or Republicans. And we have bad actors actually running and professing <laughs> uh, uh, how they kind of muck up the system running in our electoral system. Um, so I don't, Jackie, I don't know if you had other thoughts on that. But again, I don't know if that answered your question, but I do think the experimentation we have in different areas is really a good thing. Uh, and we don't have to necessarily say because it, it's adopted here that it has to be adopted in another jurisdiction. Mm -hmm. the, the, um, the only thing I would add here, um, and Bob, thank you for the question. It's great to see you. And I, I'm looking at the pots uh, behind you in, in your shot and I'm like, God, you must be like an incredible cook. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm glad to see that. But um, 
Yeah, in, in some ways, maybe just to add one point to what Tom was saying is that I think a lot of, gosh, a lot of it turns on how you identify the problem. The way that I think of, of the, the core of the problem is that the parties have managed over an extended period of time to usurp a, a quasi-governmental role. And, they, and we're now in a situation where governmental activity and party activity have become very conflated. And so I, when I think about the path to a healthy democracy and to you know, being able to reduce partisanship, et cetera, it, it, it turns on that. The parties are political parties, whether they're major parties or minor parties. And I, you know, I'm very supportive of, of minor parties and, and, and uh, hope that we can create uh, some kinds of standards where they can flourish more and develop more and be more competitive and all of that. But um, the, the political parties whose rights are protected by, by uh, the First Amendment, et cetera, should not also be in control of the processes in which right. they are competing. It's just a very fundamental thing. So when I think about the reform agenda, I look at the things that can pry open that relationship that can reposition the parties as important political organizations within a democracy that rests on certain principles. Uh, but right now we're in a situation where the parties are doing both activities. And that's, I think, just enormously dangerous and very, very destructive. So there's all kinds of ways to get there. And I think Tom has enumerated a whole bunch of them. And I know that you're working on some in New Mexico and that's great. But to me, that's really the core issue. We've got to reposition the political organizations that are competing for power in our democratic Thank you. All right, it, it's World Series time. So we have a, a baseball question uh, coming from Eugene Major in, uh, in New York. Go ahead, Eugene. Hi, uh, just, yeah, listening to the discussion and something I read over the years and I just Googled it, but I, the question is to what degree are, is loyalty to party really not about issues, but really about loyalty to a team, like a baseball, you know, like an intercity, you know, rivalry, like Mets Yankees. There's no lie. Somehow you either become a Mets fan or a Yankees fan, the really fervent ones for whatever reason or another. And all you care, and you actually like are really sad when they lose and really happy when they win. And to what degree is that a phenomenon in, in politics? But people really are not thinking about the issues of the greater good, but it really comes down to, did my team win? I, I think it's probably <clears throat> very significant and that people like that association. You know, I, what I, you know, I find a bit alarming now, you know, part of the issue of individuals leaving the party, particularly young people over 50%, who, who don't vote you know, as much as their older counterparts, about 15% left, is where they go to get their information, right? About candidates and ballots. And, you know, being part of that party allows you that political playbook, right? So if in doubt, go to your playbook, the team, and they will tell you how to vote on every ballot issue, every down candidate, et cetera. And now when you don't have that, and when, you know, 50% of young people, who fills in that void? you know, particularly with a lack of civic education and a lack of nonpartisan or neutral groups putting out information. Um, uh, but the trend is that, you know, people aren't looking at that loyalty. And I think that's one thing that we found in our research with independence is that there, that's one thing that binds them together is that they have no partisan loyalty. And that changes over time uh, based upon the issue, the candidate, the circumstance. Yeah, no, I, I, I agree with that. Full disclosure here, um, I'm a Yankee fan and I have, yet, <laughs> I have yet to acknowledge that the Mets are a legitimate baseball team. That said, <laughs> I will move on to the subject at hand. Um, yeah, I, it, it, it is a factor. And in one way, frankly, there's nothing wrong with that I, what I think, I, what I have difficulty with is the idea that what it means to be a serious voter is you have to vote on the issues and you have to understand the issues and so on and so forth. I, I think that um, 
part of what I think that's happening in the country now, which I think is really interesting, is yes, people care about issues, but at least the polling is starting to show, and I think this is fascinating, and the activity is starting to show, that people are less drawn now to what are considered traditional issues than they are to the process and the culture. You know, 25 years ago, you know, when myself and, and colleagues that I've worked with for many years were starting out in the independent political sphere, you know, working first for uh, the independent presidential campaign of Dr. Lenora Fulani in 1988 and then joining with the Perot movement in 1992. We talked a lot about the democracy issue and the centrality of process and, and you know, the mainstream attitude from the media and the pundits and the pollsters and everything was like, ah, eh, you know, who cares about that? No one cares about that. The only thing people, that's really important is issues and people have to, you know, study the issues and, and all that kind of thing. But here we are 25 or 30 years down the road and the process is center stage in right. American political life. And I, I think that is good. You know, I don't agree with some of the positions that are out there on that question, but the fact that that question is now center stage to me is very, very important. Uh, and so I, I, one of the things that I think about a lot is how do we create environments and how do we create uh, educational programs and civic engagement activities that help to bring the public more directly into engaging the process issues. Like the, you know, the question that Bob asked about, you know, well, what are the changes that you would recommend uh, to make the political system better and less partisan and more inclusive and healthier, et cetera, and so forth. I think that's a question that all Americans would do well to be engaging right now. So insofar as that's becoming more the topic of concern, I would hate to see it. the, the response to that be, oh, we have to put that to the side because we have to deal with, quote unquote, the issues. This is the issue. <laughs> well, you know, Robin, I want to bring Robin Nelson from North Carolina into this because she actually had a question that's very related to what you're saying, Jackie, about ways that independence could consolidate. Go ahead, Robin. Hope you're on mute, Robin. You're on mute. You got to take yourself off mute. Robin, you. Uh, all right, I'm going to ask Robin's question for her, because um, it's a great one. She says, should independent voters consolidate and really focus on a few steps to push for some specific changes to the electoral process that would start at the state and local level, like ranked choice voting, open primaries, but a few others as well, like ballot access for candidates. But I, I, I heard, should independents consolidate to focus on these things? Uh it's almost I, part of what I think, and I, I'd love to hear Tom's thoughts on this too. I, I think that um, it's almost like that's the, to me, the question is a little bit upside down. And the reason that okay. I say that is because the issue for independence right now, speaking about speaking now from the vantage point of that, you know, that 45 to 50 percent of the country who are identifying as independents, the issue right now for that huge sector of the American public is to gain recognition and respect for the right to have that identification. Now, in, in, in particular situations, in particular states, at particular moments, in particular campaigns, can independents consolidate uh, themselves in support of a particular political reform, for example? Well, that has happened. We've seen like the level of support that independent voters give to structural political reforms and and we studied this in New York very carefully um, when we were working closely with Mayor Mike Bloomberg uh, during the 2000s. Um, independents will will support will consolidate behind a candidate who's outspoken on the question of nonpartisan political reform. We've seen that happen many, many times. So, but I don't think at this stage of the game that you can dictate, if you will, a consolidation. I think that consolidation happens, 
the more independents are allowed into, which is to say they push their way into the mainstream. Got it. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I could add just a couple of things in there. I mean, when I look at independents, I look at, you know, personally more of a small eye versus a big eye, right? Is that not necessarily forming a new party or consolidating around a new party. But I think that the, the question is really intriguing and important because I do think there are these fundamental issues about access, right? Um, that uh, independents can continue this conversation. I mean, we knew the majority of people are against gerrymandering, uh, against electing our chief election officers. You know, these fundamental changes that independents can push. Um, but I think, you know, in the media, in, in different uh, platforms, having independents part of that discussion, because what we see now is that we, you know, we see talk shows that are hyper polarized between the Democrats yep. and Republicans, right? Democrats will take a position opposite of the Republicans and vice versa. And there aren't many independents in that mix, right? You know, to, to, to add a, a different perspective, right? Yeah. Um, and what we know from the, our own research is that when people have independence as part of the circle of friends, it, it tends to moderate and they're more open to different ideas. Uh, and, and that's very intriguing when we're, you know, the common thought is that people who are polarized live in these bubbles and don't want to associate with other individuals. So I think independence on these on these electoral reform issues uh, about access to voting, as well as any, entering into the dialogue and the political discourse is so important. And I really think that's what's missing in a lot of the coverage because everybody looks at it through the two party lens, right? They're not looking at it from this large perspective of voters who are not party affiliated. Got it. All right, we've got a lot of great questions. Uh, I want to go to Robert Brady, who has a question about taxpayer funding for partisan activity. Go ahead, Robert. You got to take yourself off mute, Robert. All right. I don't know if Robert left, but we'll uh, we'll come back to him if he's. Still well, but here. you know, uh, uh, John, if we could just address that because I think this issue of yeah, yeah, um, you know, this has come up too when we start talking about the issue of primaries, you know, and 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 how party the parties are very <clears throat> fond of their own, you know, and and feel that they should have a right to elect their own representation at different offices, but when you start telling people, is okay. But why should taxpayers pay for a system that excludes a large portion of voters? It's another issue that most people don't understand, right? But when 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 put out when that's laid out to them, it's just pause, right? Is that yeah? There's this fundamental unfairness issue about that if you know we're going to use taxes to pay for something and then exclude a large group of people, that that becomes problematic. Um, yeah. But I do think that is a, a strong arguing point. Uh, about, you know, taxpayer party funded uh, um, uh, initiatives. Yeah, and you realize how deep it is. I mean, it's not just the primaries, it's the party conventions, it's the, um, uh, what am I thinking of? The, the various campaign finance systems, it's um, the presidential debates. It's just like layer and layer of, of taxpayer funding for party activity. Right. That and really then even, you know, the this. great work that Jerry, uh, Jeremy Gruber from Open Primaries led on the election administration, yeah. you know, when you start looking at that, almost in all the states that have any type of partisan election, poll workers can't have to be Republican or Democrats, you know, yeah. observers have to be Republican, they can't be nonpartisans, you know, people right. serve as judges or on boards have to be either the Republican or Democratic Party. And when people hear that, they're like, are you kidding me? You know, if we want anyone perhaps observing or being part of watching polls, they should be nonpartisan or neutral, but they're actually excluded because of our partisan system. Yeah, yeah and maybe right. one uh, caveat, can I add one point? Yeah, here? yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, one caveat, one caveat here um, is, uh, you know, on the list of things that the taxpayers are funding, <laughs> <laughs> that they shouldn't be. Uh, I would include, you know, the whole party caucus structure, uh, both at the state level and at the congressional level, at the federal level. And, right. you know, you and I were just chatting the other day about this uh, piece that ran on MSNBC, 
uh, where they, uh, they ran this incredible tirade against Evan McMullen, who's running for the U.S. Senate against Republican Mike Lee in the state of Utah. And Evan announced the Democratic Party decided not to run a candidate and has endorsed Evan, so in some sense, it's kind of a, like a top two election <laughs> right. out there, although I believe there is a libertarian candidate on the ballot there too. But in any event, Emmett, so Evan made this announcement that he's running as an independent. If he's elected, he's not going to caucus with either party. And so MSNBC like went like ballistic about this. And yeah. they're like, you know, you know, he really, if he wants to be an independent, he really should be, a, you know, caucusing with the Democrats and so on and so forth. So. My level of outrage on this was number one that he was making that point because if you're an independent, why would you caucus with either party? But then I also thought, and moreover, the taxpayers are paying for your darn caucuses, for goodness sake. So right. there's just this is like another example of one of these things that's just like this is like so wrong. It's part of that conflation that has happened, and we just have to unravel all of that and reset everything. Um, I want to go to Harry Kresge in New York, who has a question about the Ukraine war. And then I want to go to Kip Froelich in Florida, who has a question about the rise of independent voters in open primary states. So let's go to Harry first and then Kip. Go Thanks, ahead, Harry. Great, great discussion. I saw something in the paper the other day that horrified me, and that informs my question. 30 Democrats signed a statement saying they were concerned about the situation in the Ukraine and there ought to be a negotiated settlement. And then several days later, they withdrew their statement after they discovered that Republicans uh, also, in many cases, supported that statement. Uh, that just says so much about partisanship, about our inability to move forward. And it's just says horrifying, uh, um, whatever. I'd love to hear what you think. No, you bring up a good point. I think, you know, this notion that at one time we thought, you know, there was virtue in people being able to compromise, right, and 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 to come up and, and work across the aisle. And and as people are running now, is that that scene is a cardinal sin, right? Is that you, you know, you don't want to be aligned with the other party in any type of way. And so um, I, I think that's just adding to this, this polarized system, which I think is contributing um, significantly to young people and others who, who are leaving the party and not wanting to be party affiliated. Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, God, I, don't, I mean, the level of tragedy uh, that, you know, is built into the Ukraine situation right now, it's, it's hard to fathom. Um, I, I gather the point you're making, and I would echo it, is that to the extent that the parties are operating in election season by trying to make a clear line of demarcation between the one and the other, and that election strategy is dictating our foreign policy that is that is just it's criminal yeah. um, it, it's nothing short of criminal all right i want to go to kip in florida um go ahead kip thanks john i appreciate being a part of this great discussion in Florida, we got a closed primary system. Uh, we tried to change that in 2019 or 20, the constitutional amendment that failed, did not get the supermajority. In my long life in Florida, I've registered as a Republican, I've registered as a Democrat, and I've registered as a no party affiliate, all for the purpose of participating in primaries when I thought it was important enough. My question to your uh, experts are, for those states that have gone from closed primary systems to open primary systems, are there data that show that people leave the major parties because there's no longer a penalty? Because that's exactly what I would do in Florida. Thank you. That's interesting, Jack. You know, I know that um, uh, it's a good question too, is I know that uh, the USC uh, Schwarzenegger Institute has been doing a lot of research in this area of, of open primaries and, and data, um, but I, I'm not, I don't know that answer. I mean. You would think so, <laughs> based upon, uh, uh, but, but I don't know. I mean, Jackie, have you seen anything? I know Christian Gross is doing quite a bit of work in this yeah, area. Yeah, yeah, the USC folks have looked at it. I mean, the things that I've seen, I think, is like the impact of the top two system uh, in California has, uh, uh, I believe that it has, it, it might have um, sped up the rate 
of independent identification, um, particularly among newer voters in the state, for the very the very reason that you say, which is that you're no longer you're no longer uh, penalized uh, for making that decision, and you don't have to jump around. And your and and what it does in effect, which I think is a better system, is that your contract as a voter is with the state, not with a party. And then you can you can vote for whomever you want and in, in that. But I, I think that in a way that shift of of who the contract is between, you know, um, I also think, by the way, nonpartisan, about half the states have nonpartisan voter registration. Uh, of course, the parties have found all kinds of ways to manipulate that, <laughs> you know, including, you know, getting the taxpayers to pay for creating uh, the voter roles of people who, you know, uh, chose to vote, for example, in a Democratic or Republican primary, and then, you know, and then they go out and they and they try to solicit contributions and campaign to those voters because they take them to be core voters and so on and so forth. So anyway, it's a, it's a really good question. But again, I think all roads, if you're looking for healthy roads, lead to that kind of arrangement. And and by the way, let me just say, I you know, the, the effort in Florida uh, all of y'all who worked on that, that was just monumental. That was a great gift that you gave to the people of the state. You got 57% uh, of the vote, which I, in any other state in the country would have been a massive victory, <laughs> um, but, but for the supermajority rule there. So um, I hope at some point that we can come back around in Florida and that the whole reform movement will mobilize its resources to come in and help uh, and that we can get it done. You know, just to add to that, to, to your question, Kip, um, one of the things we saw in Colorado, we enacted it, open primaries in Colorado in 2016. And since 2016, 50% of the new registrants in Colorado have been independents. So it's not that 50% of the state is independent. It's 50% of people that registered to vote since then have been independent. The other thing is you can see it on the negative side. Massachusetts and, and Pennsylvania are very similar states. They have long histories, they're East Coast states, they have strong political parties and political kind of machinery. In Massachusetts, independents can vote in a primary. In Pennsylvania, they can't. So in Massachusetts, 50% of voters are registered independent. In Pennsylvania, it's 15%. So on the flip side, one of the things we know is that in Pennsylvania, there are literally somewhere between one and two million independent voters that have joined a party against their will simply to be able to vote in the primary uh, because the primary is the only election in about 40% of the districts in Pennsylvania. Um, but to, to your point, Tom and Jackie, there needs to be a lot more research about the relationship between registration and the rules of, of primaries and other electoral institutions. Um, that's it. We have like 10 other questions, which I wish we could get to, but we've run out of time. Um, thank you everyone for joining us. Let me just make a plug. This is a great and important book. I want to encourage everyone to go to Amazon or, or wherever you buy your books um, and buy a copy for yourself and four other copies to give away to friends and family uh, people that you talk politics with. It's very accessible. It's not, uh, it's an academic piece of, of work. It's very rigorous, but very accessible. And I think um, I, I wanna deputize all of you to, uh, to help promote it and get it read and get it circulated. Um, thank you everyone. Thank you, Tom and, and, uh, and Jackie. Uh, we'll be sending a follow-up. Yeah, and we're going to be sending a follow-up email so people can access the new ASU site, some of the research that you've done, uh, so you can begin following the work that Tom and Jackie are doing. So thank you again. Have a great day, and we'll see you next month. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.